y'all are in trouble. You really are. I'm going to start in Genesis and go all the way to Revelation. No. You thought I was going to read it, didn't you? But I am going to start in Genesis because in Genesis 26, and if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to. I know we put them up here, but let me tell you what. It's a strong statement when people see you picking up a Bible. Really. I carry mine in every place. I got it in my phone. I got it in my iPad. I got it on my PC. I've got it in my hand. But when I go into the hospitals, I normally carry my dagger, my small Bible that's got everything in it. Why? Because it's a statement to people. It's a statement. I am not against any way. In fact, if you have your iPads and you have your iPhones, I want you to keep them on. Everybody tells you to turn them off. Now, you can put them to silence in case grandma calls, but that's okay. But I want you to be able to put something on that if you have a friend that you're talking to and they need to hear a note. Amen? You may want to take notes. What a thought. Let me tell you, when you take notes, here's how you do it real quick. When somebody gives you a, a, a text like Genesis 26, 12 through 25, first thing you write down is 26, 12 through 5. Genesis will be in your skull. You won't forget it. People who write down Genesis forget the other part. Huh? Write down the number. You'll remember the other stuff. That's just a simple way of starting things. Because uh, God wants us to know what we're going into. He wants you to know what he's trying to tell you. I get to be that vessel that he works through. And let me tell you, this morning was a sweet, just so sweet. I got up just refreshed. All four dogs were still sleeping, and Kathy was too. And uh, <laughs> she's not there. Where she'll come in in a minute. And uh, but the reality is, it was just it was a good night's rest and just a peaceful rest. Even though my Hawkeyes lost, God help them. I love them, but they didn't play that great. But today, today, I want to focus on a pilgrim's journey. How many know we're pilgrims? Hmm. This is not our home. We're just passing through. He says, we have an inheritance in eternity with him. We are pilgrims. And I want to look at one in particular. In fact, I want to look at Isaac this morning, a man who lived in the shadows of Abraham and Jacob. You say, what are you talking about? Abraham has over 14 chapters given to him. Jacob has at least a dozen with other uh, moments where they speak about him. Do you know how many chapters Isaac gets? One. One. Yet God called him a man of righteousness, and he included him in the hall of fame in Hebrews chapter 11. Isn't that cool? And I thought it was marvelous because in verse 20 he says to us, he's, he said he was a man that was counted for his faithfulness and righteousness. But he's not like any of, he's like any of us. He's not a man without flaw. How many know that when you read about Abraham, he lied when he was in Egypt about his wife. He called her a sister. Isn't it amazing the apple didn't fall far from the tree with Isaac? Because Isaac had to lie about his wife because he was afraid they would kill him for her. So she must have been a beautiful lady. And yet, Abimelech figures out and sees them, and they are more than just brother and sister when they're kissing. Hmm? The fact of the matter is, we have to take control of our own lives and give it to Christ. We're going to learn that today. If you're trying to handle everything, you're going to find out it's going to blow up in your face. If you think you can handle the sin in your life, I want you to know something. You can't. You can't. Because it will creep back in. It will show its ugly face again and again. And the enemy will beat you up with it. Amen or oh me. You know I'm right. God is saying, if you don't trust me with your mouth, with your eyes, with your ears, with your touch, huh? With your thoughts, you are in danger. You're fertile soil for the enemy to trap you. 
And many people live lives other than victorious because of that. But we're strangers. We're pilgrims. The scripture tells us that. 1 Peter 2.11 says that the stranger means a foreigner, one who lives in a place without a right of citizenship. And the word pilgrim means a sojourner, one who travels the earth but whose home is different. So today I want to examine Isaac in just a few passages and then give a, a picture of what I think God is just bubbling up inside of me. Number one, the scripture tells us in chapter 26 and verse 12, starting there, he says, When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted. For the Lord blessed him. Wow, how many would like to harvest a hundred times more than what you plant? Amen. And he goes on, and I, I, as I looked at that, that means that is effectively a 10,000% return on what he put in the ground. 10,000%. And as I was looking even further, it was a time when there was an incredible famine happening throughout the land. And many people were starving and dying in that whole area of Gerar. And so we've come into that point, and while everyone else was scavenging for their food and trying to make it, he, here we've got a guy named Isaac. Everything that he touches looks like it's blessed. He became a very rich man, and his wealth continued to grow. He acquired so many flocks and sheep and goats, herds of cattle and servants, that the Philistines became jealous of him. Honey, I want you to know something. If God blesses you, the world's going to be jealous. For that matter, there's going to be some... Sir, some Christians that are going to be jealous. Hmm? Let them worry about their jealousy. You stay close to God. You go after him with everything. Everything he touched seemed to be a blessing. Was it because he was a better farmer? Was it because he was a better herdsman? Was it because he understood botany and agronomy and all that stuff? No, he was walking in the blessings of God. Now, what was, the, what was the reason for the blessing? Now, if you're like me, when things get bad, you really would like to leave. Hmm? You see it all the time. You go to work and you don't like work and say, I think I'll go find another place. Maybe God has you there for a reason. Let your little light shine so others will see it. Think about it. Christians so often want to run from stuff. That's what Isaac was tempted to do. When the famine hit and all the stuff began to corrode and all, what did the Lord say to him? You stay put. And because he obeyed, God blessed him with the blessings I just read to you. Are you with me? Don't run from issues. Let God handle them. Really? Over 21 years here, there have been a few times that I thought, Lord, do you really want me to be around here? And I was hoping he'd say, no, you can go wherever you want. He didn't say that. Amen, Susan. You know what I know? If you have issues here or at another church, you're going to have them nowhere you, no matter where you go. The enemy will bring it back to focus. He'll bring back things into your memory. He'll bring back stuff. And you will begin to run from one church to another trying to find that perfect church. You ain't going to find it. No. He says, stay where you're at. Even when it looks like a famine. Even when reality it is. I think back to when First Assembly was going through a real struggle over in the other sanctuary. I mean, it was huge. It looked like it was just going to blow everything apart. And many of you stuck it through. You didn't run. You didn't cowtail. You weren't cowards. You were godly and righteous, and you prayed for that situation. Today, we celebrate it. Amen. Amen, we do. See, you can't run. If you're going to have a victory, you got to have a battle before you can have a victory. You don't get the victory if you don't go to combat. It doesn't happen. 
Nowadays, we teach our kids, well, you, everybody gets a prize. That ain't true. That's a lie. It's, kids know whether or not there's a score, whether you keep it or not. We need to be smarter than that. When you know God in a personal way, and that's exactly what Isaac did, and you honor God's word, you have positioned yourself for great blessings. Great blessings. It's interesting that many times in the Old Testament, God gives material blessings as evidence of his hand over somebody. How many know what I'm talking about? Isaac's a perfect example. Is that true in the New Testament? With the New Covenant? What blessings does he want to give you in the New Covenant that don't necessarily show up in the Old? Eternal blessings. Spiritual blessings. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. The gifts of the Spirit. Tongues with interpretations. Gift of knowledge. Gift of wisdom. All these gifts, gifts of discernment, gifts that God wants to invest in us that are not in the flesh. And here's the issue. God showed it to me this last week when I was just pondering this, and I thought, isn't it amazing? All of us want those spiritual blessings, amen? Hands up if you want them. If you don't, that's okay. I'll keep them myself. No, I'm teasing Serious. We want the spiritual blessings. But you know what? We want to look good in the world, so we want the physical, material blessings. Huh? And do you know what the New Testament tells us? Be careful. Because when you begin to be blessed, your heart begins to wander away from God. Think about it. Think about it. God says to you and me, Treasure the spiritual blessings. How many have tasted and seen the spiritual blessings of God in your life? Let me tell you what. Treasure them. Fight for them. Contend for them. Don't let the enemy steal it from you. The churches have done that. Hmm? The world has taught many churches and denominations to take the blood out of the gospel, to take the the hymns that really spoke to a generation upon generation. How great thou art. Get it out. Huh? Isn't that the way the world wants to? They want to dam up the wells that God has opened up for us. They want to put putrid stuff in there. They want the church to lose the anointing that God has given us. Beloved, it's a fight. We don't fight with the fleshly things, but we fight a spiritual war. Those things of flesh and blood, you can have them. You can have the building. But you can't take away my joy. You can't take away my peace. You can't take away the love of God in me. And you can't take away the drive that wants to see him face to face. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God may not give you a path of diamonds and Rolls Royces, but I want you to know something. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can start to write a list and you can fill the skies with the blessings of God in your life. Whew. You've got eternal salvation. Whoa! Hallelujah! Didn't need a mic for that. You know why? That is forever. And ever and ever. These things of this world are going to just decay. Second law of thermodynamics says that. You've got the presence of God in your life. I'm standing down here worshiping and tears going down my face. And I thought, Lord, what a privilege to be in your sanctuary. And your Holy Spirit just bathing my spirit, my soul, and my heart is just excited about you. God, keep us on fire. You have the power of God working in you and through you to change others' lives, 
to be a witness. You've got the promises of God that are active in your life. Promises of God. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. All things are possible with God. Sometimes we sing it. It doesn't find its place here. God wants it right here. I could go on with the list. I did. I had a long list, and then I shut it down a little. Isaac enjoyed those blessings because of obedience. Do you hear that word, obedience? Mm -hmm. That's what Scripture says. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 16 says, Finally, Abimelech ordered Isaac to leave the country. Go somewhere else, he said, for you have become too powerful for us. What? Beloved, the world realizes the church has power when they obey the word of the Lord. It isn't how good you are. It's not how great your faith is. It's how good your God is and how great his activity is when you apply faith. Isaac had an incredible blessing on his life. His provisions were phenomenal. But isn't it amazing he wasn't without his problems? It tells us that the Philistines were jealous of him and his family. Why? Why were they jealous? You know me, I'm going to ask questions. Why were they jealous? Do I need to go back and preach the first part again? Because he was so blessed. They were intimidated. Abimelech. They had honcho this whole finagle. Was intimidated. He didn't want anybody. He said anybody who touches Isaac and his family, I'll kill him. You know why? Because he was afraid of him. He says you've become too powerful. Beloved, the church needs to be powerful again. Not powerful in the eyes of men, but powerful in obedience to the word of God. Because when we walk in obedience, you walk with great provision. You walk with great privilege. You walk in great power. Do you know how we got started in the jail ministry? Somebody said, Lord, I'll obey what you told me. And now you're seeing over 100, 120 come to Christ. Beloved, there's church that goes for 20, 50 years that don't get that many people into the kingdom. It's not because we're so great. It's because he's so great. It's because he's faithful, because he's true, and his word will endure forever. Glory to God. But he had the problems. There were things in his life that weren't too pretty. And yet he still shows up in Hebrews chapter 11, the scripture of faith. The Lord tells us that those who live for him will be persecuted. How many know that? Anybody ever been persecuted at work? Raise your hand. Anybody ever been mocked and laughed at? Join the company. Huh? That's good company. That's what scripture says. Rejoice when people persecute you. What? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. There's a passage back here in the New Testament that I got a hold of. It's in 2 Timothy. Here's what it says. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You're going to be persecuted. Sitting on the city council, they're going to snub your nose at you because you're a believer. Be a part of... County commissioners and people are going to laugh at you when you give a godly answer, knowing it'll work. 
Really? You work in a place where a lot of rough men are, and they're going to laugh at you, but there will be some whose hearts will cry out, whatever he has, I want. Amen. Yeah. Fly jets, and you're going to have guys who are macho and egotistical and until their wives walk out on them, and they start looking you up. Talk to me. The world will do their best to steal your salvation. I want you to realize something here as we go back into Genesis and I keep pressing. Verse 17, so Isaac moved away to the Gerar Valley where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names Abraham had given them. We are coming up with so many names for churches today. I saw it, drove by one, and it had big X and alt on the side, like X alt, and I thought, well, that's cool. You know what? We need to be back to the basic foundations. I am a fellow citizen with Christ. I am a blood-bought slave who has been set free. I don't apologize for being Pentecostal. People like to say, well, I'm charismatic, honey. I'm Pentecostal before I'm charismatic. Really? You know why? Because the Word supports that. Charisma, you can be a charismatic and you can just be going, having a form of godliness and no power in it. But I'll tell you what, if you're going to walk in the Pentecostal efforts, <coughs> you're going to be Pentecostal. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but I'm not ashamed of speaking in tongues. I'm not ashamed of preaching the gospel straightforward and letting the marbles fall where they may. Amen. Let them roll. Amen. Amen. Why? Because the world needs to hear truth. We need truth. That's what will carry us. Amen. Truth. Isaac didn't waver. In fact, Isaac is way too nice. I know the Lord blessed him. But if they had stolen two or three of my wells, we'd have gone to war. Huh? They had, they had taken the carcasses, dead carcasses of old animals and thrown them in their wells and they had taken dirt and kicked it in there. You know what, what amazed me is that they didn't steal the wells to use them. They just didn't want the Christian to have them. There's people who don't have anything, but they don't want you to have anything. Listen to me. That's exactly what it says. They were filling these things even though they were starving. You want to talk about an idiot with a capital E? (laughs) Who would do that? Jealousy will do that. Envy will do that. It's not that they wanted it. They didn't want you to have it. That's what was happening. That's what was happening. Now, a few weeks ago, I asked you, what are things that the enemy will clog up your well with? Huh? What's he clog up your well with? Anger. Oh, yeah. Worry. Oh, honey, home run. What's that? Drama. Oh, you hit a home run on that one. Yeah. Yeah. I can. What else? Doubt. Busyness. Busyness. Oh, my goodness. Fear. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. What else? Stress. Are you listening to me? This is not the things of God. He did not bring you into this world to walk in fear. What's the promise of God? You have not been a, 
power of love and a sound mind. Amen. And water. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. What else? Some of you are sitting here today with it. It does. Yes. Are you hearing the promises coming up? See, promises defeat the enemy. You know why? Because they're not your word. It's his word. That's what he's saying. Oh. <laughs> I thought we were in an airplane. He was asking me, how much gas do you have? <laughs> That's the hand sign for, give me, a, give me a fuel check. I was empty. No. <laughs> Listen to me. What about shame? Condemnation. Boy, you nailed it. Yeah, mentioned earlier, but true. Pride, oh my God, oh my God. He said, pride comes what? Before? You think the enemy wants to stuff pride down your throat? Sure, He'll do it spiritually. He'll do it spiritually. He'll give you self-righteousness. The desire for the physical things, the natural things, yeah. Listen to me. Isaac had to reopen those wells. He had to clean them out. Stacy preached one of the greatest sermons I've ever heard on wells. I mean, I don't care who it was. If you haven't heard it, you need to get it. You need to tune back in and listen to it. And your joy will jump. You won't be able to sit down because when the God of heaven gives you a well and it's overflowing, it's awesome. It's more than awesome. It's life-giving. You can dance down the streets because you aren't walking in fear. You're not having to look over your shoulder with lies in the past. See, the enemy, one of his greatest tools for messing up your well is your past. Amen. He'll do it every time. You're not worth it. You blew it again. Hmm? You blew it again. If you clean it out, you can get fresh water. Yeah. See, Isaac had to clean out the wells that Abraham dug. And then he dug some new ones, and he ends up with two times where they name those wells. Essek. You can read it, and I can read it. I know it, but I'll read it. I practice this every time. Listen to this. Isaac's serpents, servants, not serpents, his servants, also dug in the Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But then the shepherds with, from Gerar came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said, and they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well Essek, which means argument, contention. Beloved, this is where Isaac and I depart. I'd have raised up the sword and says, you want it, come get it. Not him. God bless him. He up and picked up things and left. Now, how many know it's not easy digging a well even today? And in a desert, it's not easy to dig a well there either because they didn't have all the equipment we have. So when you got the well dug, bless God, you wanted to keep that well. That's why if you took a man's well, you declared war. See, David and I think alike. You want it? Come get it because I'm coming after you. See, Don, Don should be in the Bible too because he's the same way as I am. Let's go to war. 
Amen. That's not Isaac. Isaac moved on. And they dug another well. And it says here, Isaac's, bit, Isaac's men then dug another well, but again there was a dispute over it, so Isaac named it Sitma, which means hostility. And I mentioned the last time we were together, it's been a little while, but the fact of the matter is Sitna is the root word for which Satan gets his name. Hostility and enmity and hatred. That well was one of hostility. Beloved, Isaac moves on and God gave him a place that he called the open place and they dug another well and God gave them fresh water. There are so many things I could say about this because there's a reason that we see this in the scripture. Because God says to us to keep our wells open. Hmm? If your past has plugged up the well, God says he wants you to get past your past. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So if the enemy comes and attacks you and tries to clog up your well of the living water with your past, you need to tell him what his future is. And if it's in the Bible, you can use it. Satan, go to hell. Because that's your home. Oh, that's not spiritual. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. He will be in the lowest. He will be chained up. Hmm? Read the word. We are too nice. I remember when we were in Vietnam and we were going to targets with one bomb when you could carry a dozen and you could really do a lot of damage. But the think tanks in Washington said one bomb and we'll tell you who you can hit and when you can hit them. And we lost that war. And thank God for men like Schwarzkopf and others and McInerney who said we will not ever fight another war like that. If you're going to send us, bless God, we're going to destroy the targets. We're going to destroy the enemy. I had 64 generals sitting in a conference one time, and I was briefing, and one of them said, well, you know, don't you just want to kill the equipment? I said, no, sir, we're going to kill every one of those commies as fast as we can. And he says, don't get too excited, Major. I said, sir, you are mistaken. It takes six months to rebuild a, a tank, but it takes 18 to 20 years to build a warrior. And the four-star said to the two-star, he says, did you hear him? It's nice when the four-star backs you up. Can I tell you what? We've got one higher than any four-star to back you up. I'm serious. I'm not just talking in the wind. Christians are too nice to sin. Kill it. Destroy it. I would submit to you probably every one of us, including your preacher, has things that pop back into your mind from the past and it may even come out of your stinking lips. Like when you fall face down and say, damn it, and you don't even know where it came from. And your next word is, God, forgive me. Amen. Let me tell you what, if you've got little sins in your life, you need to work on those right now and get on your face before God and cry out and say, God, take the little things out of me. Take the thoughts out of me. Open my spirit up that I will walk in freedom and not trapped by my past. Amen. Amen. Because when you start walking that way, you talk about victory. Every Abimelech in the world will be after you to say, would you leave my country? But he won't touch you. He won't touch you because he knows God's anointings on you. How many want to live that way? I do. I want my mind to be pure. I want it to walk in holiness and righteousness. 
It doesn't mean you have to be a, a wimpy pamby. I think it takes courage to control yourself. Hmm? It takes a heart that says, I would rather follow the path of Christ than my selfish past. Yeah. Opening up new wells and old wells. The promise of God helps you open up the old wells. Yeah. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Just a simple one. There's hundreds and thousands of promises God's given us. And the church needs to walk in those. There's always a need to reopen the old wells and dig new ones. And dig new ones. And that brings me to what, one of the thoughts that I want to speak to. Starting next Sunday morning, from about 9 o'clock to about 9.40, we're opening up the sanctuary for open prayer. Not forcing anybody. We've got 815 prayer, and we have folks that come there, and we pray together over the service and where God's leading, what he's, what he's saying to us. But I know that not everybody can get there at 815. So the next one I'm going to set up is 630. And then, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> and we pray the second and fourth Sunday nights. They're powerful. If you're not there, I'm not going to chide you or beat you up or guilt you into doing that. But I encourage you to be part of them. And Sunday morning is a time to come, and we've got a lot of stuff that happens early. Sound and video and everything's getting set and the, the, the mix and everything and the, the choir and the praise team. And it all happens. But there, there are those that may not go to Sunday school. Isn't that amazing? If you're a big church and you're a good church, you don't have Sunday school. Well, grow up. Somebody's got to teach. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart. That happens in Sunday school. That happens in the men's group and the women's. But we're going to open up the sanctuary from 9 to about 9.40 that people can come to the altar. You can always come to the altar. You can come to the altar right now if you wanted to. You're not going to hear me say a word. But we're going to open it up, and you can come in and sit in your seat and pray. You can come to the altar and pray. You can walk around and pray. Pray about what? What we're just talking about. Huh? I don't know how long it'll go. It's going to be a season of prayer Sunday mornings. My house shall be called a house of prayer. We've heard it before. Many times. It's a truth. It is to be a house of prayer. But we are the house of the Lord too. He wants us to be in prayer. So the doors will be open. We'll have probably some signs saying, please be quiet as you come in during that early time. And it may not always work perfect. We may have to have times where it goes over five or six minutes or whatever to get it all set. But we open the sanctuary for prayer. You say, okay, pastor, what do I do with it? Get on your face before God. Nobody's going to play games with you. They're not going to guilt you into being here. If they do, you come see me. And I will drop kick somebody. I've sat where you're at. And God doesn't play that game with you. If the Holy Spirit convicts me, that's a whole different story. And if I know I'm doing things that do not bring him honor, I need to get before him and ask him to wash me and cleanse me afresh. You know how else you open up the, the uh, wells that have been clogged up? With forgiveness. Ask God to give you the courage and the strength to forgive. Ask God to give you wisdom on how to defeat the strongholds the enemy has built in your life. 
It may be something big. It could be like pornography or maybe even adultery. Or it may be so little that even when you think something, you feel like you've trashed the name of God. God says, I'll give you victory if you'll trust me, if you'll cry out to me. I'm preparing a sermon, another one. It's not about the wells. It's about tearing your garment. But right now, God says to me that there are those who need to clean out the well. The enemy has put the putrid, the stinking stuff of the world in it. And he says, clean the wells. There's an incredible story. You know it from a childhood. I could just about quote it to you, but that would be dangerous. <laughs> but it's rich. In John chapter 4, you read about it, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. How many know the story? Jesus is on his way and says in the scripture he had to go through Samaria. <laughs> Sychar, Shechem, Jacob's well. Here you are again at Jacob's well. Isn't that amazing? And he meets this woman and he asks her for a drink of water. And she says, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. And this well is deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? <laughs> uh-huh. How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I give will never thirst again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. I don't know if that just registers in you, but it does in me. Please, sir, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. That's not the water he was talking about. He's talking about the water he wants you and me to enjoy, to live with and forever. And maybe you're here today, and maybe this whole sermon brings us to this point. You've never dug a well. But there's one well that Jesus keeps open. And that is the well of salvation. The well that will bring eternal living water. And out of your bosom will flow rich living water. And he says, that's for you. I don't presume or assume. But if you never drank of the well that Jesus says, if you'll drink of this water, the gospel, the Christ, you'll never thirst again. Would you bow your heads? If you haven't ever drunk of the well that Jesus told the little woman, at the well. I want to pray with you today. Would you just lift your hand? I'm not going to ask you to do anything. Just want to pray with you right where you're at. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you ever asked him to take control of your life? Because you've pretty well messed it up.